The Laplace transform is at the heart of linear systems theory and control. It has the ability to turn questions about differential equations into questions about algebra. The Laplace transform is used extensively in solving differential equations and is a close sibling to the Fourier transform. When first introduced to the Laplace transform, like in, say, Nagel, Saf, and Snyder, it may seem like Laplace transform techniques applied to differential equations are completely redundant. However, what the Laplace transform allows you to do is it enables you to work with differential equations that involve impulses and discontinuities. In fact, differential equations like this don't make any sense outside of the context of the Laplace transform because the delta function itself isn't actually a function. The Laplace transform as presented in differential equations is an integral of a function against a decaying exponential. With this, a table of Laplace transforms can quickly be determined by using notions from calculus 2, and immediately we see that the Laplace transform of e to the at is equal to 1 over s minus a. What we would like is to be able to take the Laplace transform of a delta function, and more generally, the Laplace transform of functionals or distributions which reside in what are called a dual space. These functionals earned the name of generalized functions back in the early 20th century with Lawrence Schwartz. To accomplish our goal of defining a Laplace transform on a distribution, we need to talk about what a delta function is in this context. And by the end of this video, you will have a much more sophisticated idea of the Laplace transform and its applications to differential equations, and more than many professors of engineering. Now, a dual space, where our distributions reside, consists of all linear functionals that are continuous over a certain space. Without a topology, we can't have continuity, so we need a topological vector space. If you are new to topologies, don't worry. Topologies and functional analysis are fairly benign. A topology allows us to talk about when two elements in a set are close, just like measuring two points with a ruler. And importantly, when we have a sequence in the set, we can ask our topology if this sequence is converging. In our case, we are going to look at a vector space of infinitely differentiable, i.e. smooth, functions. And we're going to define topology by defining a collection of semi-norms. This is nearly identical to how it's done on the Schwartz space. Now, for this discussion, we are going to be following Beale's text, Advanced Mathematical Analysis, because I felt the presentation there was the clearest of the ones I could find, and you can find a link to that book in the description. The ideas behind these definitions all stem from the Laplace transform definition, where we want to make sure that these functions have a well-defined Laplace transform, given any s in our complex plane. Now, there are more Laplace transform functions than these, but our goal is not to define the Laplace transform on these functions, but rather on the continuous functionals of these functions, which includes the delta function. Now take a smooth u that maps the reals to the complex plane, such that for every k bigger than or equal to zero and a and r, the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the a t times the kth derivative of u of t goes to zero. It turns out that this is a vector space, which we will call L. And this follows since all of those operations are linear. Moreover, we define a topology on this space through a collection of what are called semi-norms, which are individually very close to a norm, with the key difference that they send more than one function to zero. These are as so where we take m to be any number in R. Note that they satisfy a triangle inequality, and you can pull scalars out at the cost of an absolute value. We say that a sequence of functions in L converges to another function mu in L if the difference under each seminorm goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Conversely, we have a Cauchy sequence if the difference between two elements of the sequence goes to zero under each seminorm as n and m go to infinity. In fact, L is complete, and you can see See that each Cauchy sequence is a convergence sequence in the same way that is done for the Schwartz space. So now that we have a topology, we can talk about closeness, and in turn we can talk about continuous mappings, where small changes in the input lead to small changes in the output. And one example of these continuous mappings is, well, you guessed it, the delta function. If we look at the delta function, which takes a function u to its evaluation at zero, this is a functional that is mapping functions in L to the complex plane. While delta functions manifest as functions over reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces, that isn't going to be the case here, since the shape of functionals really depend on the space in question. Now, if we take a sequence of uns that are converging in L to some function u, then that means that the difference under each semi-norm is going to zero. Now, if we set k equals zero, a equals zero, and m equals zero, then we have that the supremum of the absolute value of the difference between un and u over the reals 
goes to zero. And in particular, if we take a look at the zero point, the difference between un of zero minus u of zero in absolute value also goes to zero. Hence, delta un converges to delta u. This means that the delta function is continuous over the topology derived from our seminorms. And we can also show that the functionals that map functions in L to the evaluation of their derivatives at the origin or any other point are continuous in the same manner. These actually turn out to be derivatives of the delta function in some generalized manner. If we take a functional t, which is a map from a vector space to the space of scalars, we say that a linear functional is continuous over L if whenever un converges to u in L, then tun converges to tu in c. While the delta function can't be represented by a function, many functionals can. In particular, we call these regular functionals. These manifest by taking a function f of, say, polynomial growth and multiplying against a function in L. Then we integrate from minus infinity to infinity. We define convergence of sequences of functionals and hence a topology on the dual space pointwise. That is, tn converges to t if the sequence of complex numbers tnu converges to tu for every u. It turns out that every distribution can be expressed as a limit of regular distributions, which motivates the abusive notation that everybody is familiar with, where we define the action of the delta function through an integral. Now, what we do is we actually extend this abuse to all distributions. For a given distribution t, we write its action on u as an integral. And this leads us to the Laplace transform. Now let's give a rigorous definition of the Laplace transform. We know that for an ordinary function on the half line, which is of order one, this integral converges for sufficiently large s. We call this the Laplace transform of f at s, and then for the bilateral Laplace transform, we extend this integral to include the left half of the real line. We want to extend this to distributions. Now, going with the abuse of notation, we can write the Laplace transform of a distribution like this. However, we should be aware that this is not an actual integral. It is our distribution acting on e to the minus st. Rather, we would like it to be. But e to the minus st isn't in L for any s, so we need one more step, and that is to approximate e to the minus st with functions in L. It turns out that for any s, we can get a close approximation of e to the minus st with functions of L, where the difference between e to the minus st and a sequence of functions in L goes to zero according to our collection of seminorms, where we restrict these seminorms to those where the real part of s is bigger than a. We can do this by taking a smooth function that is one for t less than or equal to one and zero for t bigger than two, and we'll call this function phi. Then we make our sequence of functions that are going to approximate e to the minus st by defining gn is equal to phi of t over n times e to the minus st. And this ends up converging to e to the minus st. The Laplace transform of a distribution at a point s is given by the limit of the action of the distribution on the sequence of gns. So with that definition, let's look at the Laplace transform of the delta function, which according to Nagel, Saf, and Snyder, should be one. For each gn, delta of gn is equal to gn of zero, which is equal to phi of zero times e to the zero. But both phi of zero and e to the zero are one. Thus, the sequence whose limit defines our Laplace transform is a constant sequence, and its limit is one. Next time, we'll develop some nice properties of the Laplace transform, and we'll find the Laplace transform of derivatives and integrals of distributions, and I'll even tell you what those are. And then we'll be able to extract the Laplace transform of, say, the Heaviside function, and also the derivative of the delta function. This is all part of a course on control theory, and if you'd like to see the introductory lecture, then you can come here. If you'd like to follow along, please subscribe. And until next time, I hope you have a great day.